Welcome back to another episode of Light Beer, Dark Money. I'm Sean Noble. And I'm Chris Clements. It really should be, I'm Chris Clements, Light Beer. Well, welcome back to another (laughs) exciting, amazing (laughs) edition of Light Beer, (laughs) Dark Dark Money. Money. I'm Chris Clements. And I'm Sean Sean Noble. Noble. And we have a very special guest. We do. Here on our show today. An old friend has decided to grace us with his presence. My good friend, Max Finberg of Washington, D.C. and thereabouts. Hello, Max. Hello, Chris, and oh. hello, Sean. Great oh. to have you. Yeah, great to have you. It's uh, the one thing that's very fun about doing this podcast is that you meet old friends and new, and and we all have a lot of mutual friends. We're all about the same age, is my guess. We're all old. We're all, and when you said old friend, it's like, wow, we are getting old. <laughs> um, and uh, Max is a former Hill guy. And I was a Hill guy. He was on the Democrat side. I was on the Republican side. Um, Max, tell us a little I, bit about yourself. And and yet you both worked for really great men. Yeah. Men no, no who question. really kind of defined the times, I think. And right. that's, a, that's an important point. But how did you get, how'd you get started in politics? How'd you end up on the Hill? And then let's talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing now. Great. Well, again, Chris and Sean, good morning to you. I am glad to be with you and your listeners and excited to be part of Light Beer, Dark Money. (laughs) I uh, got started because of my faith. So my dad is Jewish, was raised Jewish uh, in Long Island. My mom was raised Presbyterian and Unitarian. They met in the 60s and partook of the subculture that was the hippiedom. And so when I came along, there wasn't any particular religious training or upbringing, but I had the opportunity as a teenager in high school to go to the Holy Land, to go Mm. to Israel as the birthplace of both sides of my heritage, Christian and Jewish. And when I came back, I said, I guess there's a God. I want to find out about God. But I didn't think I was going to do that in the white clapper church across the street where I grew up in upstate New York. So I turned to the Bible and I started reading in Genesis and I finished about a year and a half later with Revelation. And by reading scripture directly, I saw what was on God's heart and those who were poor, vulnerable, oppressed, widows and orphans have a special place uh, in scripture and in God's kingdom. And so that was the, and is the foundation of why I got involved in wanting to end hunger, responding Mm -hmm. to Jesus's call for, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And that coupled with my interest in politics had me working with a member of Congress who also uh, believed in God and wanted to put his faith into action by caring for those who were hungry and poor in our country and around the world. And that's been my career, both in government and out of government, but finding ways of serving those who struggle to put food on the table. And that has me doing what I'm doing now, uh, helping to lead a faith-based nonprofit called Growing Hope Globally, which works with farmers and their congregations and communities here in the United States to support farmers and their communities overseas. That's awesome. Now, interesting tidbit. I found interesting, at least maybe it's not that interesting, but you worked for Representative Congressman Tony Hall from Ohio. And then he was in, I guess, I don't know whether he was had announced retirement, but then he got appointed by George W. Bush. So he appointed a Democrat congressman to be ambassador for... I'm going to screw it up, so I'll let you tell us what he did. (laughs) He did. Uh, He was appointed by President George W. Bush in 2002 to be our U.S. ambassador to the United Nations agencies that deal with food and agriculture, the World Food Program, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the International Fund for Ag Development. Ironically, the very same position that Cindy McCain was just appointed to by a Democratic president. Yeah. So it, it really is a, a wonderful example, not just of bipartisanship, but 
of an issue, hunger, that attracts bipartisan support in ways that not everything does these days. Well, that's true. It's it's really interesting that you, I, I mean, I am in awe of the fact that you you had a mission in your mind about hunger and feeding those. And, and now, 25 years later, not only have you worked for a congressman who was dealing with that, then I presume you went to work for him as the ambassador, and and then you were with that organization for a number of years, right? Yeah, but I failed. I still haven't ended hunger, so <laughs> I got lots to continue doing. Well, Jesus did say the poor will always be among us, so... Um, it's not and, that it, there's ever an end, but it is a continuing effort. No, I, I hear you. But, Sean, oftentimes that verse is plucked out by folks who want to say that we can't fix it, so let's not. I'm not saying you're doing that. But the context of where Jesus said that was to Judas, who didn't want anybody spending money on anything but what he could take yeah, and right. it was the woman who anointed jesus for his death and burial uh so it, that context and the current one of of course we're not going to be able to end everything that causes people to be poor but hunger has a cure unlike hiv for example it has treatment but not a cure even with Biden's cancer moonshot, cancer doesn't have a cure. There are treatments, but hunger has a cure. And again, that worth verse notwithstanding, we have an obligation uh, as believers. And sometimes that's a government's responsibility. Sometimes that's an individual's all the times. That's a church's. And that's why I'm, I'm very excited to have continued my my work with anybody and everybody to make sure that hungry people can survive. Yeah, it's a great mission. It is It is not by accident that it is today is the day of the National Prayer Breakfast. It happened earlier this, this morning. This morning in the um, Capitol Visitor Center of all places. Is that right? Yeah, normally it takes place up at the well, Washington Hilton. Uh, Interesting, I didn't realize it. Max and I have attended together for, uh, several times, and Max, I think, goes almost every year. Um, I'm a I'm a junkie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Prayer breakfast junkie, love it. But uh, the last two years it's been virtual, and and today was semi virtual. I think only members of Congress and some special guests were were in attendance. You know, tell us a little bit about what you saw today and, and what impressed you and how you got involved maybe with the prayer breakfast because I'm sure that's so much of what what's led you. I think. And, and continue to define your, your mission as, as come from, from that experience. Yes. So 70 years ago, President Dwight Eisenhower had told a friend of his in the Senate that the White House was the loneliest place he'd ever lived. Hmm. And so he was invited to join members of the House of Representatives who met weekly to pray together and members of the Senate who met weekly to pray together. And that first prayer breakfast 70 years ago was just members of Congress, a handful of other guests, and the President of the United States. Today, that was recreated because of the pandemic. So it was over more than 200 members of the House and members of the Senate, some of their spouses, bipartisan. You would be shocked at some of the folks who were there because you would think that they would never be there, and they were. Right. Uh, the guest list isn't, isn't a public thing, but it was amazing. And so the original intent was to bless the president, mm. and that's what happened again this morning. So President Biden was there as he's been both uh, last year as president, as vice president, as senator. Uh, vice President Harris was there. Uh, I got a great story about that in a bit members of Congress. It was co-hosted, as it has been for many, many years, by a Democrat, Kirsten Gillibrand from New York, my home state, and a Republican, Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota, 
whose wife unfortunately just passed away from cancer a few months ago. Yeah. And it featured uh, Brian Stevenson, the subject of the movie Just Mercy uh, with Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx by the book of the same name that he wrote, uh, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. He was, he's from Delaware originally before he moved down to Alabama to work against the death penalty. And so he was introduced by Chris Coons, the senator of Delaware, who's incredibly active with the prayer breakfast, was friends with uh, Senator Jeff Flake there of Arizona before his retirement and still, and just a great testament to what is possible. So this morning was a great, great uh, example of what can be. And so you're right, it was hybrid. There were just uh, the members and their spouses there in the Capitol Visitor Center. It was live streamed around the world. It was carried live by C-SPAN. Folks can watch it by just Googling 2022 National Prayer Breakfast. And it's well worth the uh, almost hour and a half that it was to, to listen, to be encouraged, to be hopeful in ways that you might not otherwise just read and through uh, what's happening in DC otherwise. Well, it's a great example, uh, as you point out, that there's so much division and partisanship and, you know, just vitriol, vitriol, good, good word. Um, and the prayer breakfast to me is one of the, I don't know if there's anything like it remaining as far as truly bipartisan and, and really focused on how can we work together? Um, because the thing, you know, the, the issues of faith are, are super important in well, our nation and in, in the world. Um, and in, in your case, Max, in particular, the issue of hunger, which is, I, I can't think of a more important issue for people to be engaged in. A great example of how that practice has come to be just one of many stories. Sean, I saw that you worked uh, with uh, Senator Tom Coburn who was elected to the Senate, having served in the House previously, mm -hmm. the same year as Barack Obama was. They met in freshman orientation. Their wives met each other. They liked each other. And they voted against one another, I would guess, about 90% of the time. That's probably right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that relationship founded on their shared faith it might have had different expressions, but Tom Coburn, before he passed, never doubted that Barack Obama was a believer in Jesus. They disagreed, and they fought it out tooth and nail when they were in the Senate, when Obama was in the White House. But as you can see by going back to some of the prayer breakfasts past, when Obama was president, he gave such a warm and heartfelt shout out to his brother, Tom Coburn, because of what was possible. And that still is possible, despite how our differences have been exacerbated, the partisan tensions are aflame, but it really is amazing. So this morning, majority leader of the Senate, Chuck Schumer, Jewish guy from New York, read the Old Testament passage from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 about loving God and loving others. And then Mitch McConnell from Kentucky, happens to be a Republican, gets up and reads the passage from Matthew where Jesus talks about those very same verses. First time that's ever happened. Amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw that and I was, I was really touched by that. And, and uh, uh, Senator Schumer opened it up uh, by speaking in Hebrew. And, yeah. uh, which I thought was was fantastic, and and then and Mitch, of course, did, did did a great job, and they both seeing them both up there together gives people hope. And when I first moved to D.C. and met you, and 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 started spending time on these issues, I had no idea the prayer breakfast existed. I knew nothing right. about it. And then I got asked to usher <laughs> at the national prayer breakfast, and it was one of the the one of the times that changed my life. It really made me understand so much more about seeing other people in the image of God. And that's what really 
the prayer breakfast tries to achieve is you will your your heart changing your hearts and minds is one thing but once you are able to see another person not as a liberal or as a democrat or as a republican or a conservative whatever the labels are of the day if you see them as a child of god then it, it bestows upon you jesus calls us to find commonality and give each other grace and forgiveness and understanding and that's that was neat to see this morning i thought everybody did a, a tremendous job and you know the partisanship that you might feel for somebody in the issues of the day whether you know whatever it might be the the, the partisan flames the passionate flames as our founders you know kind of termed it, it it goes away in that moment and the fact that these the prayer breakfasts are you know in the house and the center are still going on today and need to be strengthened by by new believers and new new leaders i think is really important and Another illustration, my former boss, Tony Hall, who was a Democratic congressman from Ohio, became a believer only after coming to Congress. Hmm. And that led him to uh, study the Bible, to want to bring his faith into his workplace, but not in a way that was smashing the Bible over the head of others. And it was hunger that rose to the forefront as the way he could do that, especially after he was the first member of Congress to go to Ethiopia more than 35 years ago during their great famine, where a million people starved to death. He saw a couple dozen of those children die as he was visiting the missionaries of charity, uh, Mother Teresa's group there. That sparked in him a desire to work on this as an issue, both in Dayton, Ohio, as well as around the world. But it was thanks to the prayer breakfast and the, the weekly larger group, and then a smaller group where he forged a friendship across the aisle. His best friend was a Republican congressman from Virginia and Frank Wolf. Mm -hmm. And that set a model for me. So two of your former guests, both John Desser and John Hart, are two of my closest friends in the world. I don't agree with them on a ton politically, but we've shared our lives together. They were at my wedding. I was at theirs. Uh, we've walked through life together for more than 25 years, the ups, the, the downs, the goods, the bads. And it's because Jesus is able to be bigger than all of that and unite us in ways that if we give that a chance, are incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it's all for Jesus. Imagine that. Yeah. Um, so you you had a quick story about the vice president, and then let's dive into what you're working on now. Perfect. Kamala Harris is the daughter of a Jamaican dad and an Indian mom. She was born and raised in Oakland, California, and her neighbor, Sister Shelton, took her, her younger sister, and Sister Shelton's daughter to church, 23rd Avenue Church of God. The current pastor, Reverend Demetrius Meech Edwards, is a friend of mine. He's a young guy, so he wasn't there when Kamala Harris was singing in the youth choir. But that was the spiritual formation and foundation of our vice president. Fascinating. As a young and just great. So this morning, um, Senator Mike Rounds, again, Republican from South Dakota, one of 11 kids, very different upbringing than Kamala Harris's in urban Northern California, says, we have something in common. We both went to church in station wagons. <laughs> if if you're willing to find it, there's stuff there. And for those who are people of the book, Muslim, Jewish, or Christian, or especially within the family of Christ, those who profess Jesus, there is so much more in common than what divides us, no matter what we think. And for Kamala Harris, who is a believer, uh, who was formed in the same denomination that I'm a part of now, 
uh, Church of God based out of Anderson, Indiana. What a testament that she and Mike Rounds have something in common, and part of that connects to their faith. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, speaking of faith, you have exuded some a, a significant amount of faith <laughs> be tackling the issue of hunger. Talk to us about, you know, what you're working on now, what you're what you see in the future, and and how can our listeners, you know, get more engaged in tackling world hunger? I have the audacity of hope, as uh, Obama's book says, but also the audacity of faith to believe that there is an end to hunger. And that comes from the book of Revelation, when there will be no more death, where every tear will be wiped away. But I don't have to wait till heaven. I am convinced that we can end hunger because we have enough food in the world to feed everybody right now. And we will, even when the population grows to 9 billion in 25 years or so. So how do we do that? I'll get to the domestic side, but right now I'm working on global hunger. Thanks to a vision by some faithful farmers in Northwest Ohio who said, we have food they're hungry people, we got to get it to them. And so Vernon and Carol Sloan got some help from their neighbors and sent a load of uh, grain from Toledo on the Great Lakes to uh, Honduras and the Gulf of Mexico. And they realized how expensive it was to ship and how inefficient. So instead, they got together with a number of Christian relief and development organizations and founded the Foods Resource Bank modeled after the Canadian Food Grains Bank, our sister to the north. But they realized that they needed to uh, stop getting the questions about, are you a food bank? Can I get food? Are you a bank? Can I get a loan? Uh, your, one of your previous guests uh, talked to about blood water mission and said, well, we get folks all the time asking to donate blood. Mm -hmm. Nope. So we changed our name a few years ago to Growing Hope Globally, where hope is literally our middle name. And we are growing lasting solutions to hunger by having farmers and their churches and communities in the United States support farmers and their communities overseas. They do that not by sending food, but instead selling it as they normally would here. Corn or soybeans or wheat, apples, milk, beef, doesn't matter. We are very ecumenical and we're agnostic on whatever crop it is that they're growing. We have maple syrup, we have flowers. Those proceeds go through us to one of almost 50 programs overseas in two dozen countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America that are all implemented by our trusted partners, by Catholic Relief Services or Church World Service, Lutheran World Relief, World Renew, Mennonite Central Committee, groups like that that have long-standing partnerships and relationships in those countries. We just fund uh, food security, agricultural development, and nutrition programs. They might be doing health or education, great stuff, but we just provide funding for the ones that are going to help folks in those particular countries feed themselves. And that's different. In Cambodia, it might be mushrooms. In Zimbabwe, it might be sweet potatoes. In Guatemala, it's tomatoes and peppers. It just depends because they know what they need. We just help provide the tools and training that they need to get there. It's a great example of local-led, <clears throat> you know, really not saying, oh, we think this is the problem, let's go put a one-size-fits-all well, solution. It, it follows the model of, of what you referenced before, that, that Bloodwater finally had to pivot to understand that partnering with the local communities and the people who understand what's happening the best is better than the, taking just a broad brush to the, to the issue. I worked for, many, for a number of years with the United Nations World Food Program, the Nobel Prize-winning largest humanitarian agency in the world. Yeah. They feed about 100 million people. That's great. But I, even after working there in the headquarters, had trouble wrapping my hands around that. 
growing hope globally. Don't tell David Beasley small, that. <laughs> is small. We're relational. Yeah. So what's great about that is the my board chair, who's a retired banker from rural northern Illinois, who used to lend to farmers. He and his wife went to visit one of the programs they helped to support in Kenya, touched their lives, opened their eyes, changed them. We've done that for years where folks, regular church-going folks in middle America, in the heartland, have their perspectives changed because of what they see happening. And we've brought folks from all over the world to come and speak here and share the stories of impact that make a difference. So uh, I'll give you one and then go from there. The, uh, we hosted a, a woman from Cambodia, Pia. Mm. She works with World Hope International, the Wesleyan Relief and Development Organization. And they train farmers in Cambodia to grow mushrooms in dark houses, not greenhouses. And they provide the training. They talk about what's required in terms of the, the temperatures and what you need to do to promote the conditions for optimal mushroom growth. Mushrooms are fast growing. They have a growing cycle of about 21 days. So you get a paycheck every month. That meant that the husbands of these subsistence rice farmers who had to take a job in the city with a factory could come home because their wives had become agricultural entrepreneurs. Mm. And now, you know, once a month, they're getting up at two in the morning, harvesting their mushrooms, getting it on the van uh, at four in the morning. That's going to the wholesale market at six and it's in your soup for lunch. And they're getting clean water. They're able to send their kids to school or pay the doctor bill because they're making money that provides for their families. And that has happened over and over and over again with our uh, agricultural development programs all over the world. That's a great testimony to people's faith, people's generosity, people's response to, uh, to Christ's call to whom much is given, much is required. Every single one of us in the United States have been blessed by winning the ovarian lottery. We were born <laughs> yeah. here. And we've that talked means, about that on the show. Yes. Our, and we, we instill our kids with that understanding as well. They won the lottery. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard. I got a seven, this almost 17 year old daughter and a 13 year old son, and they don't know what hunger is like. Mm -hmm. Okay. They might have skipped a meal once or twice but they're not starving. And it's tough to remind them that they can't say I'm starving dad, because it's not true. Your kid's the same way. We have people who are hungry in the United States, but we no longer have famine or starvation. Right. We used to, and that changed thanks to government uh, intervention and programs that had bipartisan support from George McGovern and Bob Dole, for example. Uh, may they both rest in peace. Uh, folks who came together, Tony Hall and uh, Bill Emerson, the Republican from Missouri, and still that way today. So that's, that's great. And again, we have needs here in the United States, but nothing like the uh, on the brink of dying because we don't have enough to eat that happens overseas. Yeah. What are, what are some of right now, I mean, in terms of the work that you're doing and the terms of the work that the World Food Program is doing, what are some of the hunger hotspots that, that people don't know about that, that where, what, what you just touched on, that where people are on the, on the verge of starvation, where, where, where there are such needs that are so acute because of either failed governments or failed, or, or even our own failed policies? There are 45 million people think of famine in 43 countries around the world. Mm. And foremost among them is Afghanistan, yeah. Ethiopia, Yemen, Nigeria in the northeastern part, uh, South Sudan, all those, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Madagascar. 
And you're right, Chris, the primary drivers of hunger today are conflict, climate change, corruption, and we've added the fourth C of COVID. Hmm. Hmm. We were making great progress, amazing progress against hunger and extreme poverty. Thanks to Bono and his one campaign, forcing politicians to take a different look. Thanks to George W. Bush and his presidential emergency plan for AIDS relief in Africa. Thanks to the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Thanks to a whole bunch of stuff. But in recent years, even pre-COVID, that had started to tick up again and unfortunately is, is going in the wrong direction. And then the other thing I'll say uh, about that is it's so overwhelming. Yeah. What can I do to make a difference, right? So I'm sure some of your listeners are asking that right now. I remember being in eighth grade when uh, that great famine in Ethiopia was hitting. We remember that. We're mm -hmm. all of a certain age of rapidly approaching middle age. And my friend and I were there at the dinner at school, you know, PTA something, and we had some leftover rice. Well, let's send this over to Mr. Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously it doesn't work like that. So I've been trying to find ways of making a difference ever since. And with Growing Hope Globally, it's an amazing way of one person, one community, one rural church, one farmer, being able to make a difference because of the collective impact of coming together. So it might be that a few hundred dollars at planting season becomes a few thousand dollars at harvest season. It's multiplied like five loaves and two fish. And a farmer might uh, get some support to, for seed or fertilizer. And the farmer, him or herself, is donating their labor and maybe their land. And then the church might have a, an auction or a fundraiser or a special offering to top off what that looks like in the end. And so these rural communities are donating thousands of dollars. And you'll have a, a growing project, as we call it, in, in Michigan, and one in Indiana, and one in Pennsylvania, and one in Washington State, all come together to fund a program overseas. Right now, we don't have any growing projects in Arizona. So I would love to be uh, working with some of your listeners to create whatever the first one in the Grand Canyon State might look like. I know you guys are a desert, but you grow a ton in the desert. Yeah, we And do. it could be a farmer's market. So at, on our website, growinghopeglobally.org, we have a ton of different resources, tools in the toolbox for folks asking the question, what can I do? How can I get started? That's great. That's <clears throat> great. Well, we will, uh, I have a few, few people pop to mind that we should be talking to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that I mean, Arizona should be a part of this effort for sure. Because we've got five C's. They're different than the C's that you listed. But well, climate's one of them. Not change, just climate. <laughs> just climate, <laughs> just heat. <laughs> but we do have a, a robust agriculture industry here. Um, one of them being citrus. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that can be leveraged for something like this. No question. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the other great thing is there's so much creativity and innovation out there. We don't have a one size fits all model. Uh, we are open to all sorts. And as long as there's some connection to agriculture or even food processing, uh, Chris, I'm looking forward to our first uh, brewery saying we want to support growing hope uh, with the uh, that or a vineyard or whatever it might be. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about what you guys are thinking about and what uh, God might have in mind. That's good. I just had like three breweries just pop up in my head <laughs> That's right. that I think would actually, um, that, that, that we, should, we should double back and, and, and touch base on because I think they would be really interested in what you're doing. Who knew that you could listen to Light Beard Arc Money and start to be a little part of changing... Changing the, the landscape on world hunger. But, yeah. 
Yeah. That's why we have great Amen. guests. Like yeah, this. <laughs> absolutely. And it's and it's really important the work that that everyone's doing in this regard. So so thank you for for your vision and for your leadership. Thank you both of you for helping get the word out. Uh, it is it is a blessing to connect with people who are salts in, of the earth and light of the world who have big hearts and want to do something to make the world a better place. They might be donating to their local food bank. So St. Mary's Food Bank, as you guys know, there in Phoenix is the oh, yeah. first food bank in the entire world. And that model that John Van Hengel created has spread around the country and around the world. That's great, but we're not gonna food bank our way out of hunger in our country. And even though there are food banks all around the world, it's not the be all end all. Right. As you guys know from your focus on free enterprise, the best way to end hunger is if people have a job that pays them enough to live. Yep. Why? Because 99% of people will make sure they do not voluntarily starve, right. <laughs> nor do their kids. Exactly. Absolutely. Max, tell us again where people can go to, to follow you, to get involved in your mission, involve the organization, help hunger. Yeah. Growing Hope Globally. Long but uncomplicated. Growinghopeglobally.org is our website. Uh, we also follow us on social media, whether that's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Uh, that gives you opportunities of getting involved, whether that's donating. $55 a year will help a farmer ex escape from hunger. They might still be poor after the tools and training we provide, but they're not going hungry. Uh, starting a growing project, getting creative. Uh, I am excited to talk to those breweries and those citrus farmers and whomever else. Uh, but growinghopeglobally.org is, is the way to go. Look at our partners. It might be that you are already supporting them through your own congregation or charitable giving. Uh, again, there is no silver bullet or you know one answer. So some of your previous guests have been addressing similar interconnected problems, even if not this directly. Um, but uh, yeah, we would welcome anyone and everyone. Take a look, growinghopeglobally.org. Great. Well, thanks, Max. Max, it's been a pleasure. Uh, we'll probably have to have you back on in a while to see how things are going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah how, we get some how citrus about this? growers. <laughs> let's, let's get a growing project started uh, there in Arizona. And uh, whomever that person is, probably somebody listening right now, she or he and I will come back on and give uh, your listeners a great update of uh, what happened thanks to this. That's a deal. That's that's a great deal. And just remember that we are a podcast all based on faith, freedom, and free enterprise. And you can find us at all the tweets and Twitters and Instagram and Facebook. That's right. Light Beer Dark Money. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks, Max. God bless you and best of luck. Thank you. Take care.